Intel Battle Mage GPUs were just listed on Amazon. It's since been taken down, but we can definitely put to bed any doubt that Intel is not only going to be launching desktop Battle Mage products, but we can put to doubt any question on whether it's happening extremely soon, because those Amazon product pages would not be suddenly ready to go and accidentally published early, uh, with all the photos and everything if these products weren't fairly close to being ready to actually go on the market. Now, we've seen two different models, although they are both B580 products. So if we look at these photos from the Amazon listings, which uh, videocards.com has has available despite the Amazon pages being down by now. These were captured and, and are still available to look at. Uh, here we can definitely confirm it's an Intel Arc B580. This is the ASRock Steel Legend version. Uh, but there was also another listing posted. Again, there were two different listings. This one was an ASRock Challenger, again in Intel Arc B580. So at this point, we can be pretty confident there's at least one new Intel GPU coming out soon, and it's an Intel Arc B580. Again, B, not A. So this is not an Alchemist product, this is Battle Mage. That's how Intel indicates its product generations. Unlike with AMD and Nvidia, putting a different number in front of the product, uh, Intel does it with a letter. So their first generation was Alchemist, and their second generation is Battle Mage. The third generation would be Celestial, Druid, and so on. Anyway, so that's what we see here, but we can learn a lot more looking at the packaging. For example, look right there, we can see that this has 12 gigabytes of memory. Now that's extremely exciting, not because I think, oh yay, 12, but because uh, first of all, eight gigabyte cards at the low end are very disappointing, and yet that's what we've seen from NVIDIA with its 4060, what AMD launched with its RX 7600, and what we might be speculating that we'll see again from cards like the 5060, although we don't know for sure. But, uh, well, why am I saying lo at the low end, at least, at least in terms of, of pricing? Well, we don't know what the B580 is going to cost. It wasn't actually available for sale on Amazon, so we didn't have the pricing. However, the best thing we could look at is, well, the B580 would be the successor to the Intel Arc a580. The A580 was an MSRP of $179 and uh, has been available lower than that as well. So this was a product class that was a sub $200 GPU in the A series, which means that in the B series, even if there's a significant price increase, I wouldn't expect it to be, you know, over a $300 graphics card. That would be extremely disappointing, right? So with that being said, it looks like at least from Intel, we can expect a reasonably priced product at around 12, uh, at, well, not around 12 gigabytes, a 12 gigabyte product, it says it right there on the box, um, at this kind of lower end performance tier. Uh, the other really nice thing here is the fact that with Intel products, First of all, the biggest issue with their A-series generation was, you know, it, it, it's hard to get drivers right at the beginning. Um, it, 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 was, it was a very rough launch, but Intel drivers have improved massively over time. And one of the best things that Intel was doing with the A-series was they were right out of the gate targeting NVIDIA's feature set. NVIDIA is the ray tracing and AI upscaling, you know, uh, headliner, right? That's been their big thing. And AMD has been rather slow to try to directly take that head on. Their ray tracing performance exists, but it hasn't been making major strides. We'll have to see if their, uh, if their next generation of products do make a larger jump. There's rumors that it will be doing so. But Intel tried to take on that ray tracing, uh, you know, hardware accelerated, like, like dedicated blocks on the GPU to ray tracing right out of the gate. Also, they had dedicated XMX cores, which were designed for XESS upscaling. And XESS upscaling was right out of the gate a DLSS competitor in terms of actual AI-based, you know, machine learning trained upscaling, uh, as opposed to hand-tuned by humans algorithms like FSR that does not have its own dedicated acceleration block. 
um, on AMD's products. So the XMX engines were basically direct competitors to what NVIDIA was doing with its tensor cores. And again, they had the hardware accelerated ray tracing blocks dedicated to that. Uh, rather than AMD's more kind of a, a hybrid approach to using that on its kind of normal uh, shader pipelines. We don't need to get into the weeds on that. Uh, but the point is that with mature drivers coming with 12 gigabytes of VRAM at a reasonable price, if the performance is there and if the drivers are there, this could potentially be a really exciting product for the mainstream market. So I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful, right? I, I'm, I'm very much... Uh, optimistic that we'll start to get some competition in this space, which would be really cool. Uh, because again, uh, if we look at you know image quality comparisons for FSR versus XESS, well, first of all, there's a really important thing we need to get out of the way, which is uh, uh, XEX, XESS has two different modes, one that only runs on Intel Arc products and the other one that's a fallback that runs on uh, other GPUs. That's extremely important to make out. Let me get myself tiny and out of the way here. Ah, I'm tiny. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, just a freeze frame on a digital foundry comparison video. All my sources will be linked in the video description here. But if you've tried out XESS upscaling, you actually haven't seen the good version of it unless you have an actual Intel Arc product. If you enable XESS upscaling in a game, but you're on an NVIDIA or an AMD GPU, uh, you're using a DP4A fallback, which is not just slower, but it's actually of lesser quality uh, when compared to the XMX core accelerated uh, version of XESS. Uh, this freeze frame doesn't really show too much right here. I'll play it for just a second. Again, you should watch the full video for, for uh, bigger comparisons. But if you watch the little debris fly by once I hit play, you'll notice that like the um, DP4A version is gonna have a lot more ghosting when compared with the XMX version. And, and there's a lot of other uh, uh, other differences here as well. I guess I can uh, mute that so we don't get that. Eh, we're jumping ahead. Anyway, the point is um, you can look at image quality comparisons here, but there's a lot more of that, that kind of ghosting on these objects. Uh, the point is XEXS in its uh, actual XMX accelerated version uh, looks quite good. And it's a strong competitor against DLSS, a stronger competitor than FSR has been. It's just that most people don't have an XMX capable GPU. Uh, even when you look at the DP4A version, when paired up against FSR 3.1, uh, you can see in this freeze frame here that there's a lot more pixelation in motion on FSR 3.1 when compared with XESS, even in its DP4A fallback version, and that, that this looks maybe not as good as DLSS, but again, DLSS is not in, its, uh, in, in a fallback mode. It doesn't have a fallback mode. But again, I would say the XESS image quality looks a lot closer to DLSS than FSR does. So again, um, that's really interesting. Now, XESS is only helpful to you if it actually exists in games. And there's also an, an interesting post recently uh, on Twitter showing Intel XESS uh, you, you know, release, uh, you know, the number of games available by release year of the game. And if you're like, wait, how does a 2013 game launch with XESS? It doesn't mean it launched with it. It means it was a game that launched in 2013 that has XESS now. It was, would have been patched in at a later date. Um, now, at this point, it's over 200 games, according to Steam Database, which is where this uh, data was scraped from. So, you know, that's not as large of an install base as FSR and DLSS, but uh, I would imagine that if uh, a card like this actually gets good sales, that, you know, developers are going to be more likely to implement a feature that is, um, you know, going to apply to a larger part of their market. So if Intel can actually get an exciting product out here and capture some market share, that XESS, um, you know, uh, uh, adoption rate, I guess we could call it, uh, should only increase, which is pretty cool. So, like I said, if it's priced anything like its A-series predecessor at $179, even if it's closer to $200, $250, $250, depending on what the performance looks like, uh, but then coming in with 12 gigabytes of VRAM, that will be pretty interesting. Now, there's some other stuff that we can garner from these photos uh, that is maybe a little less exciting. For example, it does appear that only eight of the 16 PCIe lanes here are actually active if you look at these caps. Uh, you wouldn't need to cap uh, non-electrical actually used uh, lanes here. We can see that on the back of the Steel Legend card as well as 
uh, I think we can see that on the back of the Challenger card. Again, uh, only putting caps on half of the PCIe lanes. So that means it is probably only using eight lanes. However, also by the look of this, this does appear to be PCIe 5.0. So PCIe 5.0 running on eight lanes would have the speeds of PCIe 4.0 on a full 16 lanes. So that's really not a problem at all if you're on a PCIe 5.0 board. Where this could cause some issues would be uh, potentially for people on a uh, on a PCIe 4.0 board, but using this card. It would be compatible with 4.0, but it would run at 4.0 speeds, not 5.0 speeds. Now, uh, a lot of cards that have this issue, the eight lane cards, like uh, I think the RX 6600, things like that, uh, that really becomes more of an issue though, especially when you're spilling over VRAM capacity. So those eight gigabyte cards, when they spill over the VRAM capacity and have to access system memory, they get penalized really heavily. Uh, whereas the 16 lane cards still get, you know, performance penalty there, but not, not quite as severe. This being a 12 gigabyte card at the type of performance you would maybe expect from a B580, um, I don't think that that uh, is pro likely going to be a huge issue given that, again, it does have the 12 gigabytes. And again, if you're on PCI 5.0, probably not too big of an issue. Now, what would we expect from performance here? Honestly, I have absolutely no actual idea. However, uh, we could at least say that the it's probably going to be faster than an A580, or else why does this exist, right? <laughs> and the A580, according to Tech Power Up, is very similar in performance to cards like an RX 6600 or a 2060 Super. So what kind of generational performance uplift can we expect here? Well, I mean, Intel is actually in... The thing about having a first gen that's something of a flop I, is that there's low hanging fruit on a first generation product in terms of optimizations. So I wouldn't be shocked to see a fairly large generational performance uplift. So, you know, a 30% gain would put it around 40, 60 levels of performance, but with 12 gigabytes of VRAM, that would be pretty interesting. Uh, if they managed a uh, you know, a 50% performance uplift that puts it uh, near cards like a 6700 XT, uh, which has been kind of an interesting product in that it did have 12 gigabytes of VRAM coming from AMD, been available for around the $300 mark uh, quite frequently. So if this card comes in at, you know, closer to 200 or 250 and kind of offers 6700 XT level performance with, you know, a better upscaler with XESS, you know, that, that's kind of interesting, right? Uh, but again, we don't actually know where the performance is going to be. And again, we do have the big, uh, uh, you know, question mark that always hangs over Intel, which is what about the driver and software support? But like I said, that's come miles since the Alchemist series launch. Now, the videocards.com uh, article is also mentioning the 225 watt TDP. Now, it's not saying it is a 225 watt TDP. They're mentioning that it has to be lower than 225 watts. Now, where would they get that information from? Well, if you look at the images of these cards, you can check how many power connectors they have. And the, um, uh, the Challenger version seems to have one 8-pin power connector. One 8-pin power connector delivers 150 watts, and then the PCIe slot can deliver another 75, meaning that this would at maximum be a 225-watt card, although it could be significantly less than that, because as long as it's over 75 watts, it needs the, the power connector, although they did go with 8-pin rather than 6-pin. Um, anyway, so there's that. Now, uh, this also indicates that Intel is not adopting the, uh, the next-gen kind of power connectors that uh, NVIDIA has been favoring, where on the high, not that these pow power level of card would likely have the fire issues, <laughs> you know, the melting issues uh, that we've seen from NVIDIA products. Now, I believe that the Steel Legend card actually offers two eight pins. I'm not sure if we can see it in the photo here. Um, yeah, there it is. There's the two eight pins right there. Uh, but the fact that the Challenger card only offers one eight pin means that despite two eight pins indicating it could be 150 plus 150 plus 75 watts, meaning a 375 watt card. I mean, that doesn't really make sense for the 580 class product. Uh, also again, the fact that the Challenger card 
uh, is only showing one eight pin means that the actual reference for the 580 should be lower than 225 watts. All right, pretty interesting stuff. The only other big news I've seen since yesterday when I did my last hardware news video with a whole bunch of RTX 50 series leaks, you can go ahead and look at that, uh, as well as some early Black Friday sales, is uh, an update on AMD's X3D products. So we see on Twitter from Hong On Fu, I probably butchered that and my apologies, uh, we see late Jan X3D 16 core and 12 core parts. That's the parts we would uh, assume would be called a 9900 X3D and a 9950 X3D. Now the early rumors had been that these cards, uh, sorry, not cards, these chips, these CPUs, might have the X3D V-cache on both dies, uh, on both CCDs, whereas uh, that didn't happen in previous generations. However, responding to that thought in the same thread, uh, the reply is same as last gen, indicating it's actually still going to be just one of the CCDs that gets the 3D V-cache, which accelerates gaming, uh, especially, and then the other CCD would not have the 3D V-cache, uh, and those would then mostly be useful for productivity uh, workloads. This unfortunately then means that, you know, like with, with the last generation with the 7000 series, that meant that oftentimes the, the, uh, the 8 core 16 thread part ended up actually being the best choice for gaming. Uh, for one thing, because compared to the 12 core part, only six of those cores actually get the 3D V-cache, so that's a downgrade in gaming performance. And then when compared with the 16 core part, having the extra CCD sometimes, if you know, if the game threads go onto that other CCD, then, then they, those don't have the V-cache. In other words, it can cause scheduling issues, things like that, plus just more price, right? It would cost more. So uh, in other words, it's, it's likely the case that this could end up following what happened with the 7000 series, where the... Uh, the 9800X3D part that we already have ends up being the primary gaming product, and that these parts would be more interesting for somebody who is on a uh, uh, maybe a mixed workload where you do a lot of core-heavy uh, productivity work, but you use that same PC for gaming, in which case this would be very good at both. Anyway, that's the latest on that. Now, when, uh, when evaluating Twitter leaks, you have to be like, okay, any literally anyone could just randomly post crap on Twitter about products, whether they know anything or not. So do, is there a track record here? Uh, this leaker has accurately leaked information about AMD products recently and accurately. So that does indicate that they have some sort of inside information within the supply chain or something like that. Maybe motherboard manufacturers who would be more knowledgeable about these types of things. Also, this does line up with the expected announcement at CES, which has kind of just been the general uh, trend of what to expect. All right, guys, that's what I've got for you today. Hopefully you found the video useful and or interesting. I'm very excited to see what happens with these uh, Intel Arc B580s. Uh, don't know when exactly we'll find out for sure that they launch, but the fact that the Amazon pages are ready uh, it indicates it's probably soon, right? Um, and uh, I, I, if I sounded overly optimistic here, guys, like I'm just gonna be honest here, I'm excited about this. It's not that I'm an Intel fanboy, I'm far from it. I don't have favorite uh, companies, Intel, AMD, or Nvidia. What I like is competition. And with the GPU market, it feels like prices have been creeping up. Uh, Nvidia has just been utterly dominant for market share. Um, so, I, I've, I've, what a lot of people, including myself, want from Intel Arc GPUs is to shake up competition at least somewhere in the price range. Uh, so more co competition in the price range where people actually buy uh, can can only be a good thing for consumers. So I'm hoping the, the that Intel continues aggressive pricing on these. And if the, the software is short up here, a 12 gigabyte card at a reasonable price, if the performance is there, uh, this could be an interesting product. So stay tuned and I hope all of you have an excellent day.